there folks. Uh, today in mom's house we are actually going to be doing some work in the kitchen as a follow-up to our sustainability and composting discussion begun the other um, a few evenings ago with the vermiculture bin. So today I'm going to be exploring what is referred to, I believe the pronunciation is Bakashi composting. It is a uh, type, I'm going to refer to my notes because there's a lot of information here, so I do have some notes off to the side to make sure that I convey the points that I'm attempting to convey correctly as well as accurately. <laughs> uh, so Bakashi is one of a variety of indoor composting methods. Um, so the Bakashi method will involve, you can get a kit that would be like plastic buckets, something with a spigot to run off the eventual and unavoidable byproduct of this fermentation process of your kitchen waste and compost. Um, I wanted to mention that the medium that I am using for what will be my Bakashi bin is actually a, uh, it's basically a giant mason jar with a spigot. These were used for drinks uh, at our child's birthday party. It was rather offensively priced trying to get some supplies that we wanted uh, that I felt I could reuse later. So I sort of just had this off to the side as a either repeat for other parties, events, what have you, or find some other sort of use for it. So it's actually graduating today from party supply to daily kitchen staple that will help us in our efforts to uh, just kind of grow what it is that we're doing around here and uh, further our efforts in creating a more self-contained household system, more of a homestead, uh, limit the things that we're going to have to purchase to enhance our garden, our composting projects, things like that. Um, I'm in full mom glory today, as you can see, uh, still somewhat in pajamas, and the kitchen is a disaster, but I have everything laid out that I need, so hopefully we can get that all relayed through this video. So the important part about choosing the bin or container that will become your Bokashi bin is that it is A, able to be airtight. Hello, hello. Uh, it's empty right now, obviously. I am going to set all of this up today so you can see what the process looks like to get started. And I've made a couple of, not necessarily substitutions, but I've made a couple of adjustments so that I can demonstrate the principle of sourcing everything that I need from inside my house. So uh, the airtight portion of what you choose as your medium to contain your uh, kitchen scraps, what you toss in here, uh, as well as to allow the process to occur is to make sure that it's something that is airtight. This is an uh, anaerobic process, which means that the process does not, uh, it cannot have oxygen within the system. In order to get the bacterial cultures, the little <sighs> invisible to the naked eye workers that you need for the system, you need to ensure that as little oxygen as possible, preferably none at all, can um, can get into your system. So the goal here is to, with a plastic bucket, this type of container, whatever your system is, you toss kitchen scraps that are not typically allowed in composting systems, certain meats, uh, citrus fruits even, um, like the vermiculture bin, they don't do citrus fruits, you can't put dairy in there, all of those things. So anything I can't use in the system I've already created and have running and up in place, uh, anything that can't be used in that one can typically go in here. So scraps like uh, a breaded and cheese chicken I made the other night that I couldn't give to the worm composting bin I could put in here for example. Um, so you also, as part of this process, 
need first the container within the bounds of what I just specified. Okay, so this is piece one, the container that meets the requirements of airtight, something that can siphon off what will be the inevitable liquid byproduct of the aerobic fermentation anaerobic, excuse me, fermentation process. Uh, that'll need to happen about every other day once I get going. Um, so spigot, airtight, container. Okay, that's part one. So that is already here. That's not something that I had to make, but it is a hashtag reuse option. Um, so another important element here, I'm going to pull back to my notes to ensure that I explain this correctly. Uh, so Nature's typical method is going to be anaerobic composting anyway, right? Uh, natural materials will decompose in natural environments throughout, you know, the planet, whatever, uh, with non-oxygen consuming bacteria. They don't require oxygen to sustain life. So, for example, if you pile yard waste, uh, leave a cardboard box, leave several cardboard boxes outside, you can kind of typically see over time this, this degradation process of sorts. If you were to just trash your yard or your space or whatever uh, and have it exposed to the elements, you can kind of see what happens there um, as it moves from being the thing that it was when you got it, bright, uh, shiny, pretty, brand new, whatever, to the thing that, that it, it eventually turns into over time, right? Um, but putting things in a trapped or closed system and not allowing oxygen is a process that will take a longer amount of time. Uh, the professor who does a lot of sustainability work, it's really looks like the crux of all sustainability work in my area, kind of explains this as similar, the bacterial load involved in this process is comparable to what happens in our large intestines, right? Um, so it can be stinky. I am looking forward to keeping that stink contained with an airtight seal. Um, so the process does take, he says, about three to five times longer than aerobic composting, the systems that involve oxygen. Um, so there's no turning involved here, allowing room for oxygen within your system as we see in composting bins or systems, uh, traditional things that you can see, like if people just have a composting pile outside. Uh, the thing I like about this one as far as sustainability considerations, and the reason why I chose it, even though it's a little bit more complicated to explain and, and, and examine the nuance, is the fact that this can be used, this is something you could put in a classroom. If you're a teacher, you could put it in your office. If you can get your office manager on board and nobody minds looking at it, you can put it, I'm comfortable putting it in my house where I have a small child, I have pets, you know. Um, this is something that is very self-contained and still very useful. A lot of bang for a very, very low buck. I didn't have to buy anything for this that I didn't already have. And there's virtually no effort. The bacteria, as long as I have the right bacteria and the right medium to grow that culture and then feed them the things that they need to propagate their you know, species within my system and keep it balanced, uh, that that does all of the work. So it was really just researching the various elements and ensuring that I took the right steps and precautions. Uh, so I'm going to examine some of those today. So the first is that I have this drink. I will, by the way, link that professor's information in this video as well. Uh, I did borrow some of his direct commentary on this topic and this process. I felt it was just more succinct and, and more in line with what I'm trying to do here. So I'll link his info below so you can go and support some of his ideas and ventures as well, hopefully. Um, so this is a probiotic that I actually drink regularly. I think I got this one from Rainbow Blossom. It's a local uh, family-owned Grocery store runs a couple bucks. I'm um, sure you can get it at the bigger grocery stores too. I think I've seen them there before, um, but a big fan of promoting and helping local business when I can. So I'll link their info as well if you are in my area. So the probiotic bacteria that is in here, it's chilled. You can see it's sweating um, because it is a lab bacteria. I will link the name below. I'm not going to embarrass myself in this already new uh, uncharted territory for me by attempting to pronounce the bacteria that essentially feeds off lactic acid, which is um, included in here. 
Um, so I'll talk about the culture. And then I have to have a dried medium to hold the culture. So that, so here's the thing. Bran or some sort of paper material that is inoculated or essentially coated and dried, what have you, uh, with this bacterial culture. So made inactive, placed in the system on top of your compost. So you have a layer of kitchen scraps. And then after combining these two and drying them in the process that I'm about to show you, you throw your kitchen scraps into the system here, and then you just simply place a layer of this over top. Some of the suggestions for the models that I saw of various people that do this as well also suggest putting a plate on top. So you have kitchen scrap, inoculated bacterial uh, material, uh, medium, whichever word you prefer to use, and then a plate to sort of just trap as much air as possible, and then you seal off airtight in the container. So uh, some folks I know are visual learners, some folks are auditory learners, some are more kinetic, I lean more towards kinetic. So I touched on a lot of things in there, and then I'm gonna go ahead and just run through them and illustrate the things that I'm talking about by doing them myself. I uh, am coming up on needing a grocery run, so I go through and clean out the refrigerator from anything that um, needs to go. I'm not using anything that's already gone bad. I've seen some warnings against that in composting systems. Let them go bad within the system, not tossing anything that is already rotten, especially when I did the vermiculture video. I'm not going to be feeding the worms, you know, something that I myself wouldn't eat, for example. I just honestly think it's kind of rude. Um, but they also, the you know, Scientists, folks far more educated on this topic and experienced than me say that that's a no-go, so no-go it is. Uh, I had excess greenery, some asparagus from dinner, I think two days ago. Um, I have another option that I'm way more excited about for lunch today, and I don't like to hang on to those things no matter how well cooked more than uh, a couple days. I also wound up with an excess of peaches. Uh, kind of the same deal there. They're not bad, but I don't want to get them mixed up and I do a first in first out thing in the kitchen and, and the uh, refrigerator and I'm running out of room. So I'm going to use those two as my kitchen scraps because that is something that prior to these projects I probably would have just tossed in anticipation so that I had room to run to the grocery. Um, I'm very grateful that I am a person today who has overflow and needs to create space in my refrigerator to get what we need for the week. That is an amazing blessing and I am I'm very happy <laughs> to be able to have those kind of first world and privileged problems today. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get on with the process and uh, so what I'm going to do is I will go ahead and I'm going to walk these over to the sink. I'm going to let you folks hang out on the camera at the kitchen table and I'm going to take, I have a glass Pyrex um, that I'm going to mix this up in and I'm going to do this in the sink and leave you guys right there so you can kind of check out the process and see what we're up to and hopefully I won't go off screen for any uh, of this unless absolutely necessary. So. I put the Pyrex in, laid paper down. I'm gonna get just a little bit of dribble going, and then I'm gonna grab a few more pieces of paper. I wanna go ahead and have this system ready for about a week or so, as I do intend to attempt to culture my own bacterial family, a process I may do a separate video on while I do have the supplies out to describe how that works. So I would like to have something in the interim while my other bacterial family has time to grow. So just adding some more in here, flipping it around, making sure that I get a decent amount of saturation but not dripping, soaking wet because that is not what I need. Um, I may even be drinking some of my lab supplies here. Uh, not a practice that I recommend doing if your lab is somewhere outside of your kitchen. Uh, reading those MSDS sheets and always being aware of the mediums and materials that you're working with as well as their associated uh, safety hazards, risk factors, 
and being prepared with any sort of PPE that one may need. Uh, it's something that I suggest. It smells really good. These drinks are delicious. Big fan. Um, all right, great. Um, oh, it's been a morning. Um, so I brought my blow dryer out here as well to be able to kind of dry these off a little bit. And if I don't get where I need to get with that, then I'll just lay them out in the sun for a little while. Um, obviously, hopefully it goes without saying, don't plug in anything in electrical wise that you intend to run electricity to close to a water source while the water is running. You don't take your toaster to the bathtub. I'm not taking my blow dryer to a kitchen sink that is full of water and about to plug it in. So stay safe kids, no matter if your lab is in your kitchen or a professional setting, I'm going to be that mom that says safety first, because uh, my job is to keep the living beings in this house safe. So I'm all about having fun, but within our certain limits, right? So plug that in. And I did previously go over the counters again to make sure that they were plenty dry. Keep this up. Wow, that's already happening quite quickly to dry the material. So I'm actually going to go ahead and move uh, this dry rack out of the way. And I may just use the counter space to dry it off one more time since I did spill a little bit of my drink there. And I'm just going to go ahead and lay these flat and speed the process up. Uh, modern solution, modern problems require modern solutions, right? So. All right, folks, we are pretty well dried. I can fold it. It's retained the crisp crunch. As you can hear, let me get down on everyone's level again. And so my next step in the process, as I explained, is to go ahead and open my system. Now, there are uh, places that you can purchase actual Bokashi blend. It's I believe it's referred to as a as a Bokashi proprietary blend, and it's inoculated uh, bacterial species required for this process on some sort of bran material, like a rice, grain, uh, chips, like wood, ch wood chips. Um, sorry, I had to be clear there. Uh, this is essentially the same. So my, my bran-like material is newspaper, as I had mentioned in another video, uh, I'm using a uh, religious publication that we get in my parish, not meant to be offensive, something we've already made our way through, a notification publication for the uh, parish and, and organization that we belong to as a family. So if you see me tearing any of this up, it is not meant to be offensive. I want to reiterate that point again. 
it's just simply something that I had available and once we're finished with it I'd like to not throw these things away and we don't live in a recycling district so uh, those are, are my options and that is my disclaimer on fairness and inclusion uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and dump this in here ordinarily I just flop it upside down toss it into the trash not proud of that, but the more you learn, the more you can uh, you can do to, to find better solutions. So I'm gonna dump these folks in here as well. Great. Go ahead and get all of these in here because I did need to toss all of these for today. And again, in just having a moment where I'm super grateful to have the opportunity to have nutritious food readily available, not just readily available, but in excess. That's a great thing. Um, that was not always the case. And so I like to take moments to appreciate that when possible. Now, I'm also going to grab a cup of coffee. As mentioned in my last video, motherhood is not for the undercaffeinated. So, uh, so I added my trash to my, my kitchen scraps to my system. And then I'm going to take my dried and inoculated material. I'm going to get this in here. I'm curious to see because it is already a live culture and then I dried it. If that will have an effect, if it is dead dead, if it can reactivate my scientific understanding is that you can reactivate like if something has bacteria, you can slow that process down through cooling uh, and then it can kind of just come back to life once you warm it back up. If you don't warm it up enough, that's why they're cooking and temperature guidelines, things like that. So uh, I'm interested to see. And then, oh, actually, you know what? I would like to, let me see if I can find a small enough plate or something to put on here so I can attempt that part of the system to keep it compressed and keep as much oxygen as possible out. Uh, short people problems. Uh, nope, 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 lots of nope there. Um, let's see. I have this randomly left over. I wonder if we could squeeze this in here and then just kind of, no, it doesn't really do the deal either. Let's see if we've got anything laying around. Well, folks, it's not looking good on that front. So since it's lower, I have a thought. I'm gonna go ahead and screw this on. I'm just kind of opening that up. Probably won't do too much. Let me poke around for a moment, see if I can find anything that would be worthwhile to sit on my system. I am off screen scaling countertops and cabinets. Here's this coffee box with a couple things in it that actually, this is pretty heavy cardboard, so let me just tear this off and make what we need. And then I believe my daughter has likely left some rocks around, something that can serve as a weight. And still like we need it a little bit smaller. There we go. So then I can squish this into my system to sort of compress and hopefully trap a good amount of oxygen. Yeah, there it is. Nice and squished into the bottom there. And then screw this back on. Set that off to the side. 
And so I will continue to add to this system in the way outlined. So kitchen scraps, uh, some sort of inoculated brand material necessary for the propagation of the uh, bacterial species that is required in this process. And then once that gets filled up um, throughout the process, if I remember correctly, I just want to check my notes real quick. Um, I do have to keep this fairly moist and so I do need to keep an eye on that. Uh, so lacto Basilis, I believe is how it's pronounced. I'm sure there's an old chemistry professor of mine cringe, uh, cringing somewhere. Is the species required? I will link the full name and so on and so forth. Uh, so that is what is required in here. That is what I'm taking care of uh, to make this, this decomposition process happen and to yield the product that I need. So the more mundane uses of this process and the subsequent tea product that is created, I can use it to unblock drains, keep my pipes clean and free flowing uh, with this growing uh, bacterial blend and their byproducts. Uh, so what I don't want to do though is risk the potential to culture bad anaerobic bacteria, uh, things that can make us sick. So you do have to keep an eye on that in these systems in case anything goes awry, if it starts to super, super stink, if you get any kind of moldy-like buildup, uh, you know, that's that's something that we do need to monitor for and then, and then subsequently correct. Perhaps I'll do another video on that if this goes sideways, since I did use my own materials at home. There's also a process of culturing your own that involves rice washing. So you can literally just take a batch of rice, rinse it, and then ideally you would just strain the rice or you could do, you know, a setup like this where you've already got rice in the strainer and you just wash it, just run water over it, and then you would be able to take any of your leftovers, set them to the side, and then you would have a rice water blend in here would be the first step. So you collect the rice water and then it's sort of a milky colored wash uh, at the end. It will contain some of the starches that are a good food source for the bacteria that I already had in my uh, <laughs> in my refrigerator that I chose to use. That's what they sort of survive off of, those types of starches. So then you would need a um, container. I use this as an example. I like to explain different ideas along the process. This may be something I do a video on later or attempt. I would then take the rice wash from here, pour it into a, you know, some sort of jar, and then, here we go. I had a hair tie. And then you could take something like a baggy. I've moved more to reusable things instead of baggy, so I actually can't believe that I had this here. Slide it over, and uh oh, sorry for the loud clang, folks. But you could slide that over the top or the neck, take something as basic as a hair tie or a rubber uh, band, and poke holes in the top. Something to allow oxygen movement uh, while you set your rice wash outside, but also protecting it from anything incoming. Now, we are in the Midwest, so all kinds of plant reproductive matter is floating through the air and making tons of us quite uh, run down this time of year. So there's lots of things floating around out there and I would need to put something like this in place while I set my rice wash outside to do what it needs to do. Uh, so away from the elements but open to any any oxygenation that it would need. So as the bacteria from that start to work within the wash, you will see uh, some sort of change occur. Um, there will inevitably also be uh, three layers. Um, let's see here. I'm going to pause and double check. 
So I had notes. I'm going to lower you all a little bit to kind of keep this process. Oh, sorry. To keep this process clear and simple. Sorry for shaking you all around a little bit. And, and I'm just going to go back and double check this before I say something that may lead to growing a scarier pathogen in your house on accident following my advice. Let's not do that. So uh, the rice wash, right? Set aside, save this for about a week. It's literal wash and rinse, pour into a container like this with your airflow. Uh, so part two, this is your serum. So step one of creating your own bacterial culture to introduce into some sort of starch like a newspaper or not starch I'm sorry uh, some sort of like brand medium uh, into your Bakashi system so I skipped ahead by using one that I already had but if you want to culture your own bacteria this is that process that's what I'm explaining now so um, step one this is how you get your serum and then you're going to add milk to that serum after you have set this aside for about a week so you will add enough milk to it. Um, you'll collect what is eventually here. It will break into layers. And you can use, have a little uh, syringe, like a children's uh, thing that I can easily pick up from the pharmacy. Also, these nose bulbs that it tends to acquire in mass when you have children, uh, or they may look like this from the pharmacy. I got this recently with some allergy meds because, as I said, in our region, uh, plants reproductive processes are flying around our air everywhere. So uh, those are a couple options. You'll just need something to be able to not disturb the layers, but basically go in and grab the middle layer and suck out as much as you can, transport back to another bowl or medium, squirt that out, right? <clears throat> um, and then that will be what you add milk to at a 10 to 1 ratio. So this will have to be actual lactose containing milk, real milk, uh, almond milk, soy milk, won't do the job. Uh, it needs to be something that we can yield a sort of lactic acid uh, production consumption type process from into this system. So once you add the milk, then you can use another airtight container. Clearly, I have a lot of these jars. These are from different sauces and things, and I save the jars because they're useful later. So you could use this. If you want to do a big culture, you can reuse something like the mason jar I used for my Bokashi bin, something that's airtight. Uh, set that aside for about two weeks. So serum, the extracted milk, uh, the extracted middle layer of the serum, and then milk. So adding the milk in at a 10 to 1 ratio and then transporting to something else airtight, setting aside for about two weeks, and then you'll start to notice a change again in that secondary system within about a week. So uh, part three of that process would be again, so pretend we're three weeks into this process, give or take now, uh, would be again straining the solid. So this is the serum plus milk container. We're picturing that now. So you could pour it into a strainer. Uh, runoff would go into the bowl underneath. So let's do it like this. You would pour that off and then you'd have your any solid precipitate, cre precipitate created or what have you. Uh, straining the solids from this product off and then get to mix. So that part there is the bacteria food. One part of this serum that's now created and then one part molasses. Uh, baking folks say that honey is a good substitute here as well. This is just a locally sourced honey. One part serum, one part molasses, and six parts water. You can easily do this with measuring cups. Uh, I have a little set. You can do it with the graduated ones. Uh, grow as you go, or you can reuse these syringes to literally get it down to the milliliter, the thing you want to be sure of, basic science principles, is that when you're drawing off any liquid here, I'll do it with this, when drawing off any liquid matter and needing a specific amount, you need the meniscus to be the bottom bend piece to be exactly at where you need it to be. So for example, this would be the equivalent of drawing off two milliliters. So that would be something to pay attention to when you're mixing your ratios 
I'll put the recipe for that in the comments if you have any interest. And then you would do the same thing that I did with this drink and take a newspaper, newspaper of some sort, right? Um, and you would soak it, some sort of non-glossy paper. So you can't use magazines, anything like that. Um, and you would soak that and then drain the excess, which you all saw me do a little bit over there. Uh, seal it in a plastic bag and let it sit for two weeks. So you kind of want to grow that culture. Uh, the point is with mine that I use is that I dried it to sort of speed that process up to heat it, not too much, um, but to have it somewhat dry to also absorb uh, the contents and essentially bacteria food from the compost and kitchen scraps in the layer below. As you can see, it's quite wet. There's already a bit now, at least, there's already uh, a bit of juice that has accumulated. So I'm quite excited to see what that turns into. Um, after you set the newspapers aside for that two weeks, the fourth part is to remove them, set them out, let them dry, which again was, was accomplished in using my blow dryer, <laughs> so that what you have is a dried material to feed into your system. That end result of that four-part process, so the rice wash, adding milk to make the serum, and then straining solids from the above product, like the serum product, uh, and mixing the inoculating liquid, which is their food, whatever bacteria, food you choose, some kind of starches, sugars, um, and then seal, sit, and then part four, removing the sealed sitting after two weeks newspaper and laying that out to dry. Once that is dry and all four parts are completed, you should have the bacteria that you need on a dry surface to lay over your kitchen scraps. And the bacteria is what does the job of breaking down, decomposing, uh, giving you this compost result. And then the subsequent, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce the word either. It starts with an L. Uh, the, it's, it's basically garden tea or system tea. And uh, it's not something that you want to plant directly into. That fermented liquid product, byproduct of this system is highly acidic. So it's not something that you want to, to directly have contact with roots of any plants that you plan to keep at least. Um, you can literally just create a hole in your garden. And my plan for this smaller one is not just about keeping it incorporated into the household without taking up too much space, but you, I can take this very readily, it's not heavy at all, and just walk it out to the garden, dig my hole, and then open the spigot and pour my garden tea right in. After about two weeks of letting that tea sit in the soil, uh, I will have what I need, this, this golden byproduct as a combination of bacteria, fermentation, kitchen waste to uh, hopefully really grow some stellar plants, um, garden enhancement, uh, think a, a pampering uh, sort of material for what I want to get growing around here. So I'll check back on that later. I believe, oh, I did want to mention you can also dig holes in your compost. If you have a, an outdoor compost uh, space, you can also dig holes in those compost piles and do the same with the garden tea process from this bin fermented liquid system, the garden tea, right? Uh, same thing there. Uh, you would just dig a hole in the compost pile, wait about two weeks, and then you can, from either that or the dirt that you dig directly into, I just recommend separating it off somehow, wood, some kind of divider, so you know where you put it. Then you can harvest that soil, and that's what you then use for planting, which is incredibly beneficial. Um, the thing about this process is that the explanation, the research, the knowledge that went into it, the things that I had to double check are honestly, excuse me, what took the most amount of time to make sure that I'm conveying the correct material, uh, bacterial processes and bio and, and chemical reactions that take place 
correctly. So I'm going to go mom out with my kiddo. I would really like to keep off this channel for privacy and consent reasons of hers. If she wants to get on the internet one day, that's her choice. But for today, we're going to keep her off. So I'm going to go ahead and log off. As usual, she's going to get very upset. Sorry. It's okay. I'll be there in just a moment. She's hanging out with Nana today. So as usual, uh, everyone's welcome at mom's house. Come as you are. There is always a seat at the table for you. And hopefully when we all depart, we can be better beings for having been together. So uh, also drink plenty of water, eat something from the earth, get some sunshine. There's a lot of it out here today. Uh, and if you can't find any sunshine, then be the sunshine yourself. I'm going to go check on this fussy baby. Have a great day, guys.